Turn to the book of Revelation. We gave you a bird's eye view of it last Sunday, introducing it, but I never got into the verses. It is not my intent to do any kind of a verse by verse, chapter by chapter exposition, excepting chapter 1, which sets before us the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. And everything else in the rest of the book develops out of this presentation that we have of our Lord in His glory in the first chapter. I just want to read the first three verses. I don't think I'll get past those today. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Before I go any further, there was one part of the outline last Sunday when I was giving the introduction that I just didn't get to. And I just want to mention this in passing. And again, I'm not going to go into these things in detail, but I just think as you read the book of Revelation, it's a good thing to keep in mind. Remember that you've got all these sevens. You've got the seven churches of Asia, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven last plagues. It's a book full of sevens. And we talked about that last Sunday, how the number seven and the number twelve figure so significantly in the book of Revelation, and we explained why. But one of the things you need to realize about the book of Revelation is that the various visions, the visions, for example, of the seven seals, the visions of the seven trumpets, and so forth, are arranged according to their character. They are not arranged according to the time in which their events occur. And what I mean by that is when you're reading through it and you read of the seven seals, and then after that you read of the seven trumpets, do not make the assumption that the events of the seven trumpets happen after the events of the seven seals. It doesn't work that way. Do not assume that. The events signified by the seals bear a certain character. Those signified by the trumpets bear a certain character. So that the groupings of the visions are not chronological They are topical. And so, while it is true that the numbers 1 through 7 indicate a sequence of time within the visions, it does not follow that there is a chronology or sequence of time between the visions. I hope you understand what I'm saying here. So, what happens here is one vision will take us back over a period of time that is covered in another vision simply to point out the different nature, these events of a different nature or from a different perspective. So the visions will actually cover the same period of time in some cases. For example, I'll I'll give you an example that will prove what I'm saying. If you look at the vision of the six seals, it starts out there in chapter, pardon me, the seven seals, it starts out in chapter six. You will notice that when you get to the opening of the sixth seal, it points us to the day of wrath which is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation 6, 12 through 17. So we can conclude from that that the events of the preceding five seals come before the second coming. They come before the day of wrath. But then when you come to the vision of the seven trumpets, you find that at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, we're also taken up to the same day of wrath, Revelation eleven fifteen through 18. So the events preceding the trumpets, uh, uh, preceding the seventh trumpet, uh, precede the day of wrath. So what you find is this overlap of time uh, signified by the first five seals and the first six trumpets. There's that overlap of time, and they both take us up to the day of wrath. So anyway, it, it, you don't, don't assume that one vision comes chronologically after the other because the visions will cover the same periods of time, but they all sweep us to the same grand finale. As I pointed out last Sunday, if you pay attention throughout the whole of the book of Revelation, you will find that everything is always sweeping us up to the second coming, the end of all things, the final judgment, the day of wrath, and then we're introduced into the new heavens and the new earth, our eternal home. And then we were doing an overview of the book last Sunday, and I just want to remind you about chapter 1, that it begins by presenting the Godhead and the glorified Lord Jesus Christ. And everything else in the book develops out from there. And so the lesson that we learn there 
is that before we worry our heads about whatever is whatever the six trumpets the six seals mean or the six trumpets mean or whatever of of prophecy of future events we might find in the book of Revelation. The first thing we want to do is focus our attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the book starts. That's where the focus must ever be is the person and work of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, with that in view, we come to Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 through 3, which I have just read. Uh, in your hearing. Excuse me. Now this verse 1 is the inscription of the book. And it, and in fact, in these three uh, verses you have the inscription of the book, the beginning, the introduction, if you will, to the entire book. And it gives us the title of the book, the revelation of Jesus Christ, That's why we call it the book of Revelation, (laughs) interestingly enough, because that's the title it's given. It gives us the author of the book, which is the Apostle John, and it gives us the method of presentation. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant. And it gives us the purpose of the revelation and also a blessing announced to those who read and keep it. All right, now that, that's what we're going to be covering today. If you like me to tell you in advance what I'm going to talk about, I just told you what I'm going to talk about. That just laid it out for you in what's covered in these first three verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation means the disclosure. Remember in this church we stress definitions. God has revealed himself into a book of words that can be analyzed definitionally and grammatically. So we pay very careful attention to the definition of terms and the grammatical arrangement of those terms in the sentences in which we find them. So the revelation is the disclosure or communication of knowledge to man by a divine or supernatural revelation. A, a supernatural agency, I'm par- pardon me. The disclosure or communication of knowledge to man by a divine or supernatural agency. Now what that's telling you is that the information that God communicates to us by revelation is not information that we can get by any other means. You can't get this information by studying history. You can't, uh, the history of man, the history of the world. You cannot get this information by scientific investigation. You cannot get this information by studying the creation, whether you're studying the furthest reaches of the universe or the deepest caverns of the ocean. You just don't get this information that way. The only way you get this information is if God specially reveals it or discloses it to you. You see that? Understand that? That's what Paul is talking about when he says, I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So just with our senses and our minds in operation, we can't come at these things unless God specifically tells us and reveals them to us by supernatural agency, which is what happens here. Now, the word revelation itself translates the Greek word apocalypsis, which means a disclosure. Apocalypsis comes from apocalypto, which means to take off the cover. So revelation, imagine that you go to uh, an artist has drawn a painting or a sculptor has, has made a statue and you go to see what he's done. You go for the unveiling. And when you get there, there's a cloth draped over the painting or over the, the, the statue. And then they take the cloth off and now you have the unveiling and you see the work of the artist. Now that's what revelation is. It's an unveiling. It's a pulling a cover off of something that we would never otherwise be able to see. Because you see, what's happened, this book, remember, is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is the disclosure or unveiling of Jesus Christ. What this book does is it shows us where he is now, what he's doing now, and what he's going to do, which is something that we don't see presently and can't see. Uh, In Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, we read of the ascension of our Lord. And it says in Acts 1, 9, And when he had thus spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him. And this, this prepositional phrase is what I want. Out of their sight. So this was the last sight the apostles had of him on this earth. 
Now, Jesus Christ did make some appearances afterwards, as when he appeared to the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road and on a couple of other occasions. And as of the writing of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, Jesus Christ was seen last of all by me. So as of the writing of 1 Corinthians 15, nobody else outside the Apostle Paul had seen the Lord Jesus Christ until you come to Revelation, in which John is permitted to see him. And we have no record or promise of anybody seeing him on this earth again until he appears in glory. That's when every eye shall see him, as John makes plain in Revelation. And so we come over to Hebrews chapter 6 and see again that what you're having in Revelation is an unveiling. It's just like, imagine if you were in the Old Testament tabernacle and you entered into the holy place and then there's this veil and behind it is the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant, the throne room of God in the tabernacle. And imagine that curtain being pulled aside and you being allowed to see what otherwise you were forbidden to see. That's what's happening in the book of Revelation. The veil, as it were, is being pulled aside, and we're now allowed to see what otherwise we would not see. Or John was allowed to see what we don't see and cannot see, and he told us about it in the words written in the book of Revelation, but we'll come to that. In Hebrews six nineteen to 20, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, See, that veil that, that, that's hiding something from us. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus has gone out of our sight behind that veil where we see him not. Where we see him not. And then that's why Peter writes regarding believers in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. 1 Peter 1, 8. Whom, speaking of Jesus Christ, having not seen ye love, in whom though now ye see him not. I like that word now. He said, now you see him not. Thank God he didn't say never. (laughs) One day we shall see him. That's the glorious hope of the Christian. But now we see him not. Yet believing we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And it reminds you of something again that I told you when I was preaching on this a few weeks ago. I do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because I have seen him. I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because the apostles saw him and told me about it. And I believe what they wrote and what they recorded. That's, that is what I base my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ upon. So this book is a disclosure It is an unveiling of Jesus Christ in words and pictures drawn by words. It tells a lot about people when they're reading the book of Revelation and their mind is most exercised on what is the mark of the beast. You really ought to be most exercised on who is the Lord Jesus Christ and what is the Lord Jesus Christ doing knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as he is revealed in the book. Because let me tell you something about that mark of the beast. Every time you read about somebody receiving that mark, in connection with receiving that mark, it is said they worship the beast. So the main thing you need to focus on is knowing the right God and the right Christ and worshiping them, and that will be your safeguard against receiving the mark of the beast. Do you hear me? So keep the focus on the Lord Jesus and not on that mark and trying to figure out what it is. You see it? The people get, the emphasis gets all mixed up here. Start where Revelation starts, Jesus Christ. Then you're on the right path, see? That's the thing. And like I say, whether you can nail down the events or not, the one thing that emerges very clearly in the book is that we who believe in him and follow him are on the winning side of the conflict that is obviously set forward in the book of Revelation. Now, So it's an unveiling of Jesus Christ in words and pictures drawn by words. It is interesting to notice that as John sees these things, he is not commanded by the Lord to draw pictures of them. He is commanded to write words about them. And so this is an unveiling of Jesus Christ delivered to us in words and pictures drawn by words. God was not pleased to reveal himself to us in a picture book. God was pleased to reveal to us 
in a book of, please to reveal himself to us in a book of words. We relate to God not through pictures and images, but through words. Christianity is a word culture. It's all centered in words and not in images and icons and statues and stained glass windows. Now, what this book does is it reveals to us how Jesus Christ appears to us now. Or as not to us, pardon me, let me rephrase that. It reveals to us how Jesus Christ appears now in his glory. And John will see him in his glorified form uh, before we get done with chapter 1. If you want to know what he looks like now, John will tell you in Revelation 1. It reveals to us how Jesus appears now as he is at the right hand of the Father in glory. And it also reveals to us what he's doing now and what he will do, all of which are things our eyes cannot behold and therefore could not know unless it was revealed to us by supernatural agency as it is in the book of Revelation. Now, let me make a practical point. As I look over this information and meditate on what I bring forward, I'm reminded of something that I hear Jim Ruma say often, and I value this very much. Whenever Jim listens to a sermon or goes to a men's meeting, mind this, Greg, the most important thing to Jim is, what is my takeaway? Meaning by that, what did I get from that that I can take away that's going to make me a better person and a better Christian? That's the most important thing. Do you realize that? The most important thing about what I'm communicating to you today is not simply filling your head with information, which I do plenty of, but filling your head with information that's relevant to the life you're living right now, teaching you how you can live it better and more for the glory of God. That's the most important thing, people. In fact, that's the whole purpose of the divine revelation, including this book of Revelation, as I shall show you, Deuteronomy 29, 29. So like he says, what's my takeaway? What did I get out of that that I can take away and make me a better person? Because the Bible is an intensely practical book. It is written with a practical aim. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, and you've often heard me say what I'm about to say again, but I just love saying it, so I'll say it again. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God. If there's anything that gets my goat, it's somebody that proceeds to tell me what the secret will of God is. (laughs) If you know what the secret will of God is, it's no secret. That's just it. Secret things belong to God. But those things which are revealed, you got it right here, belong to us. And our children, but notice why they're revealed to us. And they belong to us and our children forever. That we may do all the words of this law. God's revelation of truth to us has an objective to influence what we do. What we do with the words of this law. There's information gathering and there's information gathering. I just want to stop and talk about this a little bit. Because as I move forward in this Revelation 1, the thought in my mind is, how am I going to be able to communicate this to you that's going to have a practical value? Again, a takeaway that you're going to be able to walk away and it's going to help you get through the week and be a better person, help you to grow, which really, that's what Christian growth is all about. It's becoming better and better and better. And following Christ, serving Christ, modeling Christ before this world. And these things are revealed to that end. If Christ is the supreme love of your life, and he ought to be, and I'll tell you why. Because Jesus Christ is God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1 1, 1. John 1, 14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The man Christ Jesus is God in human form. He is Jehovah. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the great I Am. And that being the case, we have this commandment delivered to us. I'm going to give you Christ's rendition of it in the book of Mark. In Mark chapter 12, 
29 through 30, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, and that's Jesus Christ, by the way, as well as the Father and the Holy Spirit, is one Lord. And here's what I'm after. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God, i.e., Jesus Christ, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Christ should be the supreme love of our life. The one we love with all our emotional capacity, all of our mental capacity, all of our physical capacity. The supreme love. And if he is the supreme love of your life, then to learn more of him should be your chief pursuit. This is one of the fascinating things about love. When you love someone, you want to know that person. You want to know more about that person. You remember the song. I've told you this before. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. That's what's involved in romance. That's what's involved in love. That's what's involved in friendship. It's getting to know a person more deeply. And it's not only true of persons, but it's true of things. If there's a particular subject that you learn, uh, that you are interested in, and you love the pursuit of that subject, you want to know more and more about it because of the love that you have for it. And that's okay. As long as it is always second to and subordinate to the supreme love that we should have for the Lord God. Ted Decker made an interesting comment, and I agree with him. We have been made by God to obsess. We all obsess about things. That's a tendency we have. We were made by God to do that because we are supposed to obsess about Him. That's what it is to love with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. When you love something with that much of yourself, you could say that you are obsessed. We were made by God to obsess, but the problem is, is we take that marvelous capacity of obsession that should make us the best Christians we can possibly be, and we transfer it onto the creature, and we obsess about somebody, or we obsess about a sport, or a, uh, something, or a TV series, or whatever, and go on and on and on down the list, or making money, or the stock market, or politics, or whatever, and obsess about all that stuff, instead of the Lord God Almighty. Now, it's okay to love other things again, but those other things that you love, instead of being in the place of God, should be stepping stones to take you ever deeper in your love of God. As you receive those things as creations of His, sent into your life to, br- to meet your needs, to bring you pleasure, but you always go beyond it to the source, which is the Lord God Himself. So if Jesus Christ is the supreme love of your life, as He should be, then to learn more of him should be your chief pursuit. And that should make, therefore, the study of the revelation of Jesus Christ more fascinating. That ought to get it. That that ought to commend it to you. That's what I'm trying to get across. If you come to Philippians 3.8, let's look at this uh, knowledge of Christ being the supreme, of supreme importance. It was to Paul. Philippians 3.8, Yea, doubtless... And I count, but all, count all things but loss, everything, for the excellency. This excels, this goes beyond anything else of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. The knowledge of Him excels the knowledge of any other thing that you might be able to attain. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You may not win first place on your bowling league or on your ball team. You may not. You may not be the valedictorian of the class. There may be many an award that will pass you by that you will not win. But if you win Christ, you know Christ. You have Christ in your life. You walk with Christ. You follow Christ. You have won the most excellent thing there is to win, considering he's the king of kings and lords of lords and the supreme being of the whole universe in whom it pleased God that he should have all preeminence and most importantly should he have that in our lives and ambitions and aspirations. 
to win Christ. So if knowing the Lord Jesus is your chief pursuit, which it should be if you love him chiefly, then the book of Revelation, the revelation of him as he's introduced in this first chapter should take on the greatest importance. But I made a statement, I want to go back and visit it and elaborate on it, especially in our day and age of information explosion. Information explosion. Knowing the Lord Jesus is the most important thing. There's information and there's information. To lay the groundwork for this, and I know I've talked about this either in a sermon or a Bible study, so if this is review, it's good review for me, so it should be for you as well. I do these German meetups because I speak the German language, as you know, and I love to go to these meetups and practice. And right now, uh, we can't get together, so we do this Zoom thing, which it just falls so far short, far short of the real McCoy. Because when you're in a meetup group, you can have a conversation maybe with this one or with this one, and there could be several conversations going on at the same time. In the Zoom, only one person can talk at a time. So it, it hinders the, the practice that we get to have. And so once a month, they meet at a, at a, at a bar and grill on what's called trivia night. And uh, that's my least favorite night because I don't go there to hear questions posited to me by somebody in English. I go there to speak German. I don't want to speak, hear English or speak English or have to do that English to German. I just want to be exclusively in German when I'm there. That's the whole idea. Well, anyway, while we're not doing that, can't do that right now because of the lockdown, we're doing this Tuesday night Jeopardy night. Let me tell you something, you're looking at a first class dunce when it comes to Jeopardy. I mean, I came in last place last time. I had gained so little that I risked everything on the last question and came out earning nothing. It makes me feel so stupid. And you've got these young people there, and I'm amazed at how much they're able to answer all these questions. But then I come, and these are intelligent people people that I'm having these meetings with. You can tell in discussing with them. Some of these people are very fluent in German. Very good. Uh, You wouldn't know if you were talking to them, but what you were talking to a native German. They've studied it. They're passionate about it. And we really have a good time connecting together. And there's one lady there. She's the native German. And the rest of us were Americans that are learning it. And once in a while, we get another native on board. But anyway, this has occurred to me about these young people that are able to answer all of these questions. And the one that I hate the most is the one about pop culture. I don't know anything about pop culture. I don't care who sang in what group, what song. Or then they ask about sports. And yeah, I don't care. I don't know who jumped the furthest in the Olympics in Mexico City whenever it was held. And I could frankly care less. None of this interests me. Did you know that I root for, the Wolver- root for the Wolverines and I couldn't tell you the name of one single player they have and frankly could care less? I don't worry my head with all that stuff. I don't need to know it. All I need to know is when they beat up on the Buckeyes so I can get even with some people in here that aren't loyal to the state that butters their bread and upon whose soil they live and whose hospitals rescue their children. (laughs) To put it bluntly. Amen? Amen? Have I got a witness? All right. I thought so. Absolutely. No wonder they, they wear the color red. That's the color of the devil. Anybody knows that. Anyway, but, 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 but you know, the truth of the matter is at the end of the day, I really don't care. It doesn't matter. But the point is this, is they have these heads full of all this information, but I stand back and ask, do they know the significance of all these facts? Do they have these facts knit together into some comprehensive whole? Miriam Joseph, in that fascinating book called The Trivium, said that just the accumulation of facts is not an education. 
All it is is it just gluts the mind with a bunch of information. She says those facts need to be connected and integrated together in a comprehensive whole so that you see how they relate to each other and you get the larger picture of what all of this means. What is it worth to accumulate a bunch of facts that at the end of the day all you can say is you know them? What does that do for you? What's the takeaway? How does all that make you a better person, makes you understand the world you live in better, and how you can better deal with it, all that information, you see? And so that's the wonderful thing about a Christian education. That's a wonderful thing about an education that is founded in the knowledge that we receive in the revelation of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is the linchpin that connects all the facts of history and of the universe together. He's the linchpin. It is by Him it is created. It is by Him that it consists. And furthermore, it is for Him. And when you understand Jesus Christ, you understand the conflict that was introduced at the dawn of time between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Then things begin to come together and to make sense. But we are living in the age of the information explosion where you can sit at an iPad and you can go from YouTube to YouTube to YouTube to YouTube to YouTube to YouTube YouTube ad infinitum. Just stuffing your head with information after information after information. But let me tell you, it pays all of you to stop and ask if you're doing that. What is the purpose? What is the profit of all this stuff that I'm jamming in my head? What's it going to do to make me a better person and a better Christian? That's so important. I want to read something to you in this book by Neil Postman entitled Amusing Ourselves to Death. This is a tremendous thing. He said, it may be of some interest to note in this connection that the crossword puzzle became a popular form of diversion in America At just that point when the telegraph and the photograph had achieved the transformation of news from functional information to decontextualized fact. Now let me just break that down. It it was a means whereby a bunch of information could be transmitted to us that had no functional purpose. We had, it was decontextualized. It didn't really fit into the context of our lives. Why do I need to know about an earthquake in China? Let China take care of their own earthquakes. Why do I need to know about some mass shooting in Texas? Let Texas take care of it. I'm going to tell you what I think. I think that taking those local events and making them public on the media only encourages more of it. Part of the thing that keeps that stuff going is the publicity. To say nothing of the fact that the more of that kind of thing spreads around, the more people live in the grip of fear, and people who live in the grip of fear are more manipulated by the government because they want to be, they want to feel safe, and they'll trade away their liberty to feel safe. That's my opinion about it. I don't think we need to know about all that stuff. But here, what has happened with mass media is events from all over the globe are brought into our living room. So it may be of some interest to note in this connection that the crossword puzzle became a popular form of diversion in America at just that point when the telegraph and the photograph had achieved the transformation of news from functional information to decontextualized fact. This coincidence suggests that new technologies had turned the age-old problem of information on its head. Where people once sought information to manage the real contexts of their lives. Now they had to invent contexts in which otherwise useless information might be put to some apparent use. The crossword puzzle is one such pseudo context. The cocktail party is another. The radio quiz shows of the 1930s and 1940s and the modern television game show are all still others. And the ultimate, perhaps, is the wildly successful trivial pursuit. In one form or another, each of these supplies an answer to the question, what am I to do with all these disconnected facts? And in one form or another, the answer is the same. Why not use them for diversion, for entertainment, to amuse yourself in a game? Because it serves no other purpose. 
Now, am I saying it's wrong to play Trivial Pursuit or do a crossword puzzle? No. But I am saying that the proliferation of this is indicative of where our culture is. Remember that one of the signs of the last times is they will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth because they will stuff their head with facts but they will not know how to connect these facts to come at the truth that is behind them. This is so extremely important. So in the consumption of information it pays all of us to stop and ask ourselves from time to time what need have I of it? Here's a biblical question. It comes from James 2. What doth it profit? That's a very important question. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? You see, brethren, no matter how much truth you know and how much you believe it, what profit is it if it doesn't translate into how you live and what you do with it? Do you have that? That's so important. Remember, knowledge puffeth up. But charity edify it. God expects you to take whatever knowledge you get and turn it into charity. And charity is that which is the bond of perfectness. Um, I'm, let me go on with this. I, I won't finish Revelation 1 3 today, but while I'm on this roll, I might as well see it out to its conclusion. Another thing that's very important. Um, Oh, before, before I go there, though, let me, let me grab this, because this one hit me yesterday. Hit me yesterday. As many times as I've read this passage, and as many times as I've preached on it, it just, boom, hit me yesterday of an, of an additional insight that I had into it. In Second Peter, there are seven things that we are told to add to our faith. And the first is virtue, and the second is knowledge, and the third is temperance. And I thought it very interesting that after he mentioned knowledge, he followed it up with temperance. You know what temperance is? is? Rational self-restraint. Don't be by knowledge like a lot of people are by food and drink, where they not only eat to the point of being nourished and strengthened, but they eat beyond that to where now they are eating uh, just just adding on pounds and extra fat and extra weight that now turns around and has a destructive effect instead of a nourishing effect. You remember I preached on that a few Sundays ago. I said the, that food is sanctified by the Word of God in prayer. But when you eat food in violation of the Word of God, as you do when you eat like a glutton, eating more than is needful for your nourishment, now eating to satisfy an addiction, instead of food being sanctified, it now becomes a curse. It's now hurting you rather than helping you. That's so important, people. So in pursuit of pleasure, or whatever it might be, food, television, movies, novels, whatever, sports, temperance is the order of the day, keeping those things in due restraint. And the same is true of knowledge. Isn't it interesting, right after knowledge, add temperance? Because you can actually fill your head with too much information. There are things, brethren, number one, we don't, we're not supposed to know. And there's a lot of things we don't need to know. And you, it's, a, it's, 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 it's just a fact of nature. You stuff your head with too much useless information that you don't need. That's going to shove out information you do need to make you a better person. And Satan knows that. And that's why he comes up with devices to just pump your head full of a bunch of trivia. PhD. Yes, yes, piled higher and drier. That's exactly what it is. That's why Paul said he counted all that. There's, there's scripture behind that statement. That's why Paul said he counted all that stuff but dung that he might win Christ. There comes a point where information too much that you don't need is only so much blubber on the brain like too much food puts blubber around the middle. It's just that way. And Jesus warned us about that, that kind of thing, choking the Word of God. So anyway, temperance needs to be exercised here. There's things that aren't, we aren't supposed to know. There's things about you I don't need to know. You know why? It's your private business. It's none of my business to know. And trying to find out is being what the Bible calls a busybody. That's a very serious crime in the Bible. Do you realize it? Pardon? Hello, Facebook. Exactly, exactly. Exactly, Justin. 
Did you know that it was the desire to know what one did not need to know that got us in trouble to start with? How did Satan tempt Eve? You eat that forbidden fruit, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil, which they didn't need that knowledge. It was the desire for knowledge of what they didn't need to know that brought about the downfall of our parents. There's knowledge and there's knowledge. But when you know Jesus Christ, you can take whatever knowledge is out there, and it's endless, and run it through the grid of Jesus Christ, and that'll help you to find out what you need to know that's going to make you a better person, which is what it's all about. What's the takeaway? That's the important thing. Instead of just filling one's head with information. But this is another thing. Um, and this is important. Listen to me carefully. The study of creation science is fascinating. It's a great study, and thank God for people that do that. That people that can see the handiwork of God in the creation and see the evidence for the biblical account of creation and the biblical account of the flood. But do you realize you can know ever so much about that and come to the conclusion that this world was created as God said it was, but that only brings you to the threshold of Christianity. That doesn't make you a Christian. Do you know that? That doesn't make you a Christian. You can know all about manuscript evidence and come to the conclusion that the A.V. 1611 King James Bible is the preserved pure word of God in English. But that doesn't make you a Christian. That just brings you to the threshold. Now you know God made the world and he gave us his word. Great. Wonderful. We need to know that. But that's just the starting point. You know what Christianity is all about? Relationships. Relationships. How you relate to God how you relate to your brethren in the church, how you relate to the outside world, how you relate to the government, how you relate to the environment, how you relate to events events in your life, how you relate to yourself. That's what Christianity is all about, relationships. And what is the bond of perfectness in relationships? Charity. Knowledge puppeth up, but charity edifieth. And the knowledge that does not aid me in deepening my love for God and for Jesus Christ and the things I ought to love is knowledge I don't need, no matter how interesting, how addicting it might otherwise be. Very important, very important. You can't know everything. We have to recognize our limitations. One of the things that has impressed me that in all of the disciplines of learning, I don't care whether it's art Writing, building, music, you name it. Science, there's no end. There's no end to the number of pictures that can be drawn. No end to the number of poems and stories that can be written. In fact, Solomon himself said of the making of many books, there is, what? No end. There's no end to the number of mathematical calculations that one can make. There is no end to the number of tombs that can be composed. No end. Or the structures that can be built and how they can be varied and made to be different one from another. No end. You pick any discipline of learning and there's no end to it. Anything in this creation that you can study, there's no end to how far you can go in it. Which you know what that reveals? That reveals that this world was made by an infinite God. It bears that impress of infinity in it. So, brethren, the point is, is you and I are limited in how much we can know. You need to understand that. We can't know everything. And therefore, it is important that we do by information what we do by drink and by eating. And that is, we put restraints on it and we have some grid whereby we're able to process it and say, you know, as interesting as this is, if it's a choice of spending my time to know this versus this, I better spend my time here doing this. If it's a choice for spending more time in front of my computer absorbing information or going to minister to some poor brother in need, which should I choose? See what I'm saying? The poor brother in need. That's what you do. Instead of just satisfying this lust for more and more and more stuff that just gluts the brain. So anyway, there's your takeaway. (laughs) The revelation of Jesus Christ, the importance of learning of Jesus Christ, 
That's the most important thing to know, the most important person to know. Because the more you know about him, the more you will love him and be induced to love and and follow him. All right, now let me get into the next part. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Just wanted to show you why this is important. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. That's the purpose of the book. He just told you right there. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. The book of Revelation is a disclosure of future things. No question about that. No argument there. It is a disclosure of things that would occur in the future. But notice to whom it is shown. Unto his servants. In other words, this book isn't written to just the whole world in general. This book is specifically addressed to the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And who are those? Those are the ones that own him as their Lord and Master and do what he says. He made this plain in John chapter 13. John chapter 13 in verses 13 through 17. Ye call me Master and Lord, which means we're servants. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet... Ye ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. And when we do that, what are we demonstrating when we do that? What is that a physical demonstration of? It's a physical demonstration of a mindset of a servant. Verily, verily, I say unto you, and he'll tell you this. The servant is not greater in his than his Lord. Neither is he that sent greater than he that sent him. If this wasn't beneath me, Jesus is teaching us, as your Lord, it's not beneath you as servants. So demonstrate your servants by following your Lord and Master. If you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. And then in Luke 6, 46, Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? So the servants are the ones that do what their master said and do what their master exemplified, thus following his example. And uh, just keep that thought in your mind because as we move further in the study, well, I'll go ahead and give you the sneak preview of what's coming. This book is written to make known to things to servants of Jesus Christ. But then when you go on down in Revelation chapter 1, and you go down into, um, let me make sure of my comment, verse 4, you will find that the addressees of this book are the seven churches of Asia. It's to make known things to the servants of Jesus Christ, but it's directed to the seven churches of Asia. Put them together and what do you have? You have the definition of what a true New Testament Lordship Church of Jesus Christ is. And it's a group of people that serve Jesus Christ. And I told you in the beginning of this series that there are two things that should emerge from this study. It should make you very glad that you know the Lord Jesus and very glad that you are a member of a New Testament church. Because it's the members of the New Testament church that are called the servants of the Lord, Jesus Christ. And that makes some people mad when you tell them that if you are not active in a local church of Jesus Christ, you are not one of his servants as defined here. But people, I didn't write the book. I'm just telling you what it says. You got to figure it out from there. And take it to the judgment seat. But like I said, it'll make you glad you're in a church. Because this was written to churches. It wasn't written to the world at large. It was written to churches to inform them of things which must shortly come to pass. Now notice the things shown here must shortly. It is important that we we define that word shortly. It means in a short time. Not long after the present or point reached in a narration. Soon. But in early use, as would have been the case here, it means with little delay, speedily, quickly. What he's telling you here is these events in Revelation, when they begin to happen, 
there are things in here that when they begin to happen, they will happen with great rapidity. They will happen quickly and speedily. Amen. Consider this. Christ has tarried now for 2,000 years since he was here. And in Hebrews chapter 10, but notice what we read about his future coming. In Hebrews chapter 10, 37, for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Jesus is waiting right now. He's tarrying. He's tarried for 2,000 years. But when he comes, when he does, he's not going to be tarrying then. He is going to come with a suddenness and quickness that is going to be astonishing. That's why we always want to be ready because when you least expect it, there he is. It's amazing. And then that was actually a quotation of Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3. If you'll let me go over there now. I say if you'll let me. I don't know why I said that because I'm going to go there whether you let me or not. (laughs) I, I don't know why I would ask your permission for where I go in the word of God. Yeah, trying to be polite, that's all. Trying to be nice. I have to work at that, you know. As do we all. As do we all. If there's one thing I've learned in dealing with people, nobody, and you've heard me say it before, and you'll hear me say it again, nobody, but nobody, but nobody, but Jesus is wonderful. So when you meet somebody and you think, oh, this person is wonderful, get to know them better. You don't know them well enough yet. (laughs) And you will find out they are not wonderful. None of us are all that nice. When I meet somebody that's super, super nice, my antennas go up. Watch out. People that are too good to be true are just that. Too good to be true. Habakkuk 2, 3. Did you know Judas Iscariot spoke with an oily tongue? If you'd hung around Judas Iscariot and listened to that guy talk, you would have thought he was the nicest guy you ever met. And that's the one that betrayed the Son of God. Sometimes the reason people get real syrupy and sweet with you is they stick a knife in your back. Or do what uh, I believe it was Joab did to a guy, you know, goes up to him to give him a greeting and takes him by the beard. <laughs> Under the fifth rib and killed him with a kiss. <laughs> That's how Judas betrayed our Lord, with a kiss. Never you forget. Habakkuk 2, 3, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. The idea is, is that when Jesus Christ comes... It is going to happen all so fast. Or when those final events in earth's history, those cataclysmic events that we read about in Revelation, when they finally happen, they will happen so fast. Boom, 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 boom. It'll be amazing. I told you, God often works that way in our lives. You wait and wait and wait for something, and then when it finally happens, you can hardly believe it because it happens so fast. Maybe a burden you've borne for years, and then one day, like that, the Lord just takes it off of you. And it's over. And, and, and it amazes you how he works that way. So that's the way it'll be at the second coming and the events that immediately precede it. Whenever they do happen, they will happen with great rapidity, great, great speed. Um, and, and just to show you one other verse that, that bears that point out. If you'll come over to Luke chapter 18, Luke 18, 7 and 8. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him? And don't they do that? They have for 2,000 years been crying day and night to God to be avenged of their persecutors and of their enemies. That's why I had us pray Psalm 119 this morning, especially in what we're living under right now, for God to deliver us from this oppression, this heavy hand that's pressed on it. And be praying about something. I mentioned it. I, mentioned, I didn't mention it online uh, the other night. I mentioned it to some friends. Uh, Just this week, the Prime Minister of Canada is consulting with the premiers and is considering allowing people who have family in Canada to go over to see them. Of course, I have a daughter and grandchildren over there. Please pray that God will take that flaming left-wing liberal Trudeau and move him to 
have compassion on us in our captivity. He can do it. He's done it before. If he could make Pharaoh bend and let Egypt, Israel go, and if he could make Nebuchadnezzar bend, he can make Trudeau bend. And I pray he will, because I want to see my babies. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's, it, 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 there is an iron curtain right now. I can't even get over to Canada, see my family. In Luke 18, 7 through 8, and I also want to see our brethren that live over there. Pray to God that the days hasten when they can be back here and fill some of these empty spaces that they've left. And we haven't, we, 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 we're holding your place, brethren, in Canada that are watching me right now. We're saving your spots when you get back here. Actually, there are people sitting where you normally sit, but <laughs> I, I will see that they are, I will see that they are moved <laughs> when you come. <laughs> and we will make room for you, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> I got to be careful there. We don't want to get too used to their not being here. I do miss them and they miss us. At least we can be here. In uh, Luke 17, 7 through 8, Jesus said, And shall not God avenge his own elect? Don't you love that word, people? Elect. Bible teaches it. Of all the things we mortals know, election sounds the best, said the poet. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him? You see, they don't cry in day, day and night to become elect. They cry because they are which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. See, 2,000 years that cry has been going up. I tell you, he will avenge them, watch, speedily. When he finally executes that vengeance on the enemies of the church, it will happen with such rapidity. And by the way, the Greek word translated speedily there is the same one that's translated shortly in Revelation 1.1. So it's interesting in in history, oftentimes God's work of judgment on the wicked is short. It's executed speedily. While I'm on this point, let me give you uh, uh, three verses along that line. Come to Romans chapter 9. It's a speedy work. This particular verse is talking about God's judgment upon the non-elect Jews. Paul deals with the division in the nation in Romans 9 through 10, that not all the seed of Abraham are children, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And he goes on and he traces that to God's election. And he uses Jacob and Esau as an example, because Jacob and Esau were both equally the biological seed of Abraham, but one was God's child and one wasn't. And it was all traced to God's election. So just because a person is a part of the nation of Israel, whether he's a part of it by biological descent or whether he is integrated into it by circumcision, what constitutes him a child of God is not his membership in that nation, but God's choice of him. And as far as those who are not God's children in that nation, they, like the rest of the non-elect, come under the judgment of God. And this is what Isaiah refers to when he's quoting from Isaiah 10, uh, what Paul is referring to when he quotes from Isaiah 10, 22 through 23. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, see, the numerous nation, yet a remnant, that's only a part of them, shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And you scratch your head and you think, what is he talking about? What is this short work that he will finish and cut short in righteousness? Well, if you compare it with Isaiah 10, he'll put the two verses together. It'll define what that short work, short work is. If you go over to Isaiah chapter 10 that he's quoting here in, in Romans 9, we read in verse 21, the remnant shall return No, pardon me, verse 22. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. And here's the short work he's talking about in Romans 9. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. He will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. For the Lord of hosts shall make a consumption even determined. And when a thing is determined, it's got a boundary, a limit on it. He will finish the work and cut it short in the midst of the land. So in other words, when God's judgment comes upon these people, it will be a short, quick, speedy work, cutting them off, consuming them in judgment. And then look at at, uh, Psalm 610, Psalm 6 and verse 10. Watch it now. 
Let mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed. And here's what I'm after. Suddenly, the judgment is sudden. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, from my last reference, you see, it things which must shortly, quickly, speedily come to pass. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, for when they shall say peace and safety, of course, what is the big thing that governments are aiming at right now, huh? You have a shootout somewhere. So what do they want to do? Implement government control. They they had a shootout in Nova Scotia. Now that prime minister in Canada has outlawed even the purchase of an assault rifle by a law-abiding citizen. All in the name of safety and peace. And of course, what's the thing about this coronavirus? We're going to keep you safe, 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 safe. Peace and safety, peace and safety is the great aim of the states of this world. And when once they have achieved it, watch out. Watch out. That's your signal. When they shall say peace and safety, then watch it. Sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. Just like a woman that's with child and she's going along and all of a sudden, ooh, time. <laughs> Sudden travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So you see, these things, when they come, they come quickly. They come speedily. Quick judgment upon the wicked, and a quick release and deliverance for the righteous. I just think it'll be wonderful. We'll be walking along one day. Maybe you're cutting the grass. The next news, you know, you're in the clouds. That fast. Boom. Twinkling of an eye. So you see... When the end time events, the end time events of Revelation, and not all of the events in Revelation are end time events, but when the end time events, the ones that bring us right up to the the end of the world, when they begin to transpire, they will do so shortly. They will shortly, quickly, speedily come to pass. So the adverb shortly does not demand that everything prophesied in Revelation had to be fulfilled very soon after John wrote it, as some have wrongly assumed. Now, let me make one more point. I had more, but let me get this one. Oh, the best one. Oh, the most fun one. I don't think I'm going to get to. But anyway, let me get you this one. Because this one, this one's pretty cool. This one's pretty neat. This will be a good takeaway. This will be something to look forward to, okay? And you know, if that's your takeaway, if I've brightened your hope, given you something to look forward to, to think about with anticipation and excitement, I'd say that's a pretty good takeaway. Because you know what you know what the essence of depression is? Hopelessness. People who are depressed lose hope. And so if I can come here this morning and I can give you hope and I can nourish hope, I've given you something to offset depression about not being able to go over the border to see your kids if you're in my shoes. Or some something like that. And, 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 and that's very important for a time like this because one of the problems they're finding now with all this lockdown is an increase in emotional problems. I went to my primary care the other day for another issue and on the way I was listening to the radio and they were talking about the increase in mental problems from all of this. And he says, we're seeing more and more of that coming through the door. More and more of that, yeah. Well, the BIM studies have been done showing that depression produces death and suicide. And they are estimating now there may well be more deaths by suicide and depression than by COVID-19. It could be. It could be. Our president even mentioned that. So, that, I mean, this is a, this is a serious thing. And, and I, I'm just talking among you, uh, many of us, myself included, struggle with being depressed over what's going on. So I need this kind of stuff. You see, I preach to me when I preach to you to nourish hope. But notice this thing, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to him. So notice the revelation God gave to Jesus. All right, now what does Jesus do with it? Which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So what happens is this revelation originates with God, the Father, He gives it to his son, Jesus Christ. His son, Jesus Christ, gives it to the angel. And then the angel gives it to John. And then John writes it to the servants, the seven churches. I want you to notice the chain of command. God is the author of what we call chain of command. His own kingdom functions that way. 
I think it'll be that way in heaven. There will be, while we will be heirs of everything and enjoy it all together, we will have different positions and different responsibilities in the scheme of things, just as do the angels. You have, for example, an archangel. That's the angel that's up here at the top. And then it breaks down into various principalities and powers, just like we have it in our governments in the world today. You have the federal government, then it breaks down into the state, and then in the state into the counties, and into the counties to the municipalities, and then from the municipalities down into individual families and churches and so forth. That's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, God has a hierarchy in, 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 in his kingdom, and you see that here, the chain of command. And um, this also, the fact that Jesus delivers it to this angel that he sends. Jesus sends the angel. So what does that tell you about Jesus Christ? He has authority over the angels. Very good. Uh, Very good. You can conclude that easily from that verse. But why not get a verse that says it? Why not just stick one in there that says it? 1 Peter 3.22, speaking of Jesus who has gone into heaven who is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Lists angels first. So angels are subject to Jesus Christ, and so they go where he sends them. Now, notice something about this angel. He identifies himself curiously. Let me get this point. Just let me get this point. This is a good one. In Revelation 22, this angel talks to John a little bit about himself. Tells a little bit about himself. In verse uh, 8... And nine, I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not. People, if an angel would not receive the worship of an apostle of Jesus Christ, an apostle even, What is some pope doing accepting worship from people? Letting them bow down and kiss his ring. And the very man that they claim was the first pope, Peter, when he went to the household of Cornelius, Cornelius fell down at his feet and he said, Get up, I'm a man like you are. What the pope ought to do when somebody bows down to him like that, grab him by the hand and yank him up, and if he doesn't do it, then kick him over to the side and say, worship God only. And so he says, he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. He said, see, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. I'm just like you are. I just do what God tells me to do. I'm a fellow servant. I love that fellow servant. And but what? Look at this. And of thy brethren, the prophets. You know what that angel is telling him? I'm a prophet, and I belong in the brotherhood of prophets, just like you do. Just like you do. Because you see, angels have functioned as prophets in history, used of God to reveal his word. God spake in sundry times and divers manners unto our fathers by the prophets, some of whom were angels. Who was it that announced to Joseph that the child in Mary's womb was of the Holy Ghost? It was an angel. Who was it that told Joseph to take the child down into Egypt because they were seeking his life? Uh, Matthew 2.13, it was an angel. Who was it that told Joseph to go back into the land after Herod was dead? And he took him back in and took him and raised him in Nazareth. Who, Who instructed Joseph to do that? An angel. Who was it that appeared to the father of John the Baptist to announce his birth and tell him how to raise him? It was an angel. Who was it that appeared to Mary to announce to her the conception and birth of the Christ child? It was an angel. And then look at Acts seven fifty three. See, God has used angels throughout history as prophets are used of God to reveal his word. And I taught you about that recently, that prophecy is the revelation of the word of God. Prophets are instruments through which God reveals his word. And then in Acts 7 and verse 53, talking about the law of Moses, it said to the Jews, or Peter, uh, Stephen spoke to the Jews and said, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When God delivered the law on Mount Sinai, angels were involved in that disposition that disposing of the law to Moses. Interesting. And then in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2, for if the word, talking about the Old Testament, 
the law of Moses, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. So you see, angels have functioned as prophets. Well, guess what? John the Apostle was also a prophet. He functioned as a prophet. I can prove that from Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 11. And he said unto me, this is talking to John, thou, thou, John, must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So, John functioned as a prophet, this angel functioned as a prophet, and therefore this angel was of John's brethren, the prophets. See that? They were in the brotherhood of prophets. John was a brother to prophets, be they men or be they angels. He was a brother to Isaiah. He was a brother to Jeremiah. He was a brother to Micah. And he was a brother to Gabriel. And he was a brother to this angel that was delivering to him this revelation. But, but it gets sweeter yet. Go back and see what that angel said about him. And this is the point we'll close out on today. And that's where he said in verse 9, See thou do it not, Revelation 22, 9, For I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets. And he extends the brotherhood out beyond the prophets of them which keep the sayings of this book. That's you. That is I. If we're doing what we ought to do, keeping the sayings of this book. If we are, angels are our brethren. Isn't that amazing to think about? You see, one of the things that Jesus Christ did on his cross is he established a brotherhood of men and angels. You have the holy angels of God called the elect angels, and because of the fall of man into sin, that put a barrier between us. Now, Jesus Christ, having removed that sin barrier between God's elect and the angels, now they are reconciled together and become a common brotherhood and a common fellowship. I I can prove that. I can prove that. I said that, but I can prove that by taking you to Colossians, taking you to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross... By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. We're things on earth. Angels are things in heaven. And we're all reconciled to God through the blood of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that we constitute now a brotherhood. Can you imagine? And and, and just look at this vision of what we have in heaven. And this will be my last passage. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, Ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. You see, brethren, in heaven, men and angels blend together before God in their worship. And you see a vision of that in Revelation chapter 5. Now, just imagine the great angel Gabriel, the one that announced the birth of John the Baptist and the birth of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary. Imagine one day being able to walk up to him as you walk up to me and say, Hello, Brother Gabriel. It sure is nice to meet you. Brother Ben, it's nice to meet you too. Do you realize as a person that fears God, the Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps around you? You do have what has been called a guardian angel that has saved you from dangers you never knew were lurking in front of you. You never knew it because he was there to stand between you and that danger. Imagine the day coming when you're going to be personally introduced to your guardian angel and you're going to greet each other as brethren as we greet one another in this church. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's kind of exciting. That's something to look forward to, don't you think? That we are a brotherhood with angels. 
Thank God. Well, that's as far as I got today. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which he, God gave unto him, and he sent it unto his, to give unto, show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. That's as far as we go today. Thank you very much, and God bless you.